welcome to X-Ray Review. This is a quick guide to spondylolisthesis, how it looks on an X-Ray, different types, classifications, sample exam questions, and little tidbits of information about spondylolisthesis. All right, so let's start with a few terms to know. The term spondylolysis is an interruption of the pars interarticular is caused by a stress fracture usually and that's going to happen in early adolescence or childhood and this radiolucency through the pars interarticularis is that term spondylolysis a spondylolisthesis is a term used to describe any anterior translation or displacement of a vertebral body in relation to the segment immediately below it so in this case we have a spondylolysis with anterolisthesis and here you can see L4 in relation to L5. So this is a spondylolisthesis of L4 because it's moved anterior in relation to L5. Here are a couple other terms to know. We have an anterolisthesis for an anterior displacement, a retrolisthesis for a posterior displacement, and then a lateralisthesis for a lateral displacement. All right, so what does a spondylolisthesis look like on an x-ray? Here's a pretty classic example of a large spondylolisthesis of L5 in relation to the sacrum. We can see on the lateral view that L5 has translated anteriorly significantly, either a grade 3 or grade 4. There's loss of intervertebral disc height. No obvious evidence of a pars defect on this view. When we look on the oblique radiograph, we can see a pars defect, which is that spondylolysis. And then on the frontal radiograph, this is L1, 2, 3, 4, and this is L5, demonstrating an inverted Napoleon hat sign. And we're basically seeing an axial presentation of that L5 vertebral body. And this is a good example of what a spondylolisthesis looks like and we'll break it down and look at all the different pieces of it. There are three different widely accepted methods of measuring for an anterolisthesis. George's line, Meyerding's, and Ullman's. George's line is the most widely accepted line of mensuration for measuring for an anterolisthesis. Here Lines are drawn in the posterior aspects of the vertebral body, and you're looking for at least two millimeters of anterior or posterior translation. Less than two millimeters of translation is not statistically reliable, so we're looking for at least two millimeters of translation to call it a listhesis. Meyerding's grading method can be very useful. You're basically dividing the sacral base into four equal parts, and then you're looking at the posterior aspect of the L5 vertebral body, and then seeing how far it's translated anterior in relation to the sacrum. So if it's fallen zero to 25% in this first quadrant, then that would be a grade one on Meyerding's, and grade two, three, four, and then five respectively, if it's moved all the way anterior to the sacral base. Ullman's line is my least favorite method of measuring for a spondylolisthesis. You're looking at the anterior aspect of the L5 vertebral body and then drawing a perpendicular with the sacral base and seeing if that L5 anterior inferior corner has really gone anterior to this perpendicular of the sacral base. And this can be helpful, but in situations where the patient's either extremely hypolordotic or hyperlordotic, you can kind of get some um, false positives or false negatives. So Ullman's line can be helpful, but personally I would stick to uh, Meyerding's and George's. There are a number of different reasons as to why a spondylolisthesis would be there. And the Wilkes classification system breaks it down into dysplastic, isthmic, degenerative, traumatic, pathologic, and then post-surgical or iatrogenic. Type 1 dysplastic or congenital spondylolisthesis is going to be some type of congenital osseous abnormality that's leading to the spondylolisthesis. This is typically going to be the most severe type of spondylolisthesis.
So here you can have an underdevelopment, uh, congenital underdevelopment, usually of the upper sacrum, articular process, uh, sometimes the neural arch of L5, and you can have dysplasia of the L5, S1 facet joints and articulations. So here you can see L5 in relation to the sacrum, the underlying abnormalities posteriorly, failure of development posteriorly, and that leads to a very severe spondylolisthesis. A type 2 anterolisthesis is one of the more common types, and this is any spondylolisthesis that occurs due to an alteration of the pars interarticularis, typically a stress fracture. Here is a radiolucency extending through the pars, an anterior translation of L4 in relation to L5. The spinous process remains where it should be, but everything else has moved forward. And this is a classic appearance of a type 2 isthmic spondylolisthesis. And the most common type of stress fracture in the, in the spine is going to be a pars defect. So these are common to see, L5 being the most common area, then L4, L3, L2, L1. Here is an example of a type 2 isthmic spondylolisthesis with a pars defect, anterior translation of L5 in relation to the sacrum, trapezoidal L5 vertebral body shape, loss of L5-S1 intervertebral disc height, and the spinous process is where it should be, L5 has moved forward. These are all classic findings of this type of spondylolisthesis. Now there are three subtypes of a type 2 spondylolisthesis. Subtype A is due to a stress fracture, very common. Subtype B is due to elongated pars, which is usually elongated due to multiple injury or healing events. And then a subtype C, which is an acute pars fracture from a single event, and that's typically rare. An example of a type 2 isthmic spondylolisthesis, anterior translation, pars defect, loss of disc height, and spinous process where it should be. In this example, we have two isthmic spondylolistheses at L4 and at L5, both grade 1, possibly grade 2. The shape of the L5 vertebral body becoming trapezoidal is not a good sign and may be indicative of instability. In this example, there is a spondylolysis or pars defect of L4, but there is no obvious evidence of anterior translation. So this would be referred to as a spondylolysis of L4 without evidence of anterolisthesis. The third type of spondylolisthesis on the Wilts classification is degenerative. And this is due to severe long-standing degenerative arthrosis, typically moderate to severe. This arthrosis is usually going to be in the facet or zygapophyseal joints of the lumbar spine, and that contributes to the anterior translation of these segments. So here is an anterolisthesis of L4, severe facet arthrosis posteriorly, and we can see that the entire L4 vertebral segment has moved anterior, including the spinous process. And again, this is due to long-standing degenerative changes. Type 4 spondylolisthesis is due to a traumatic etiology. And while you think this would be common, it's actually extremely rare to have a, a macro trauma event that causes an isolated fracture like this. In the cervical spine is actually the most common location at C2 referred to as a hangman's fracture. And this is a very severe medical emergency. And what we can see on this image is a bilateral pedicle fracture of C2 causing a slight anterolisthesis of C2 in relation to C3. Again, not common and usually a pretty significant um, traumatic event.
A type 5 spondylolisthesis is due to underlying pathologic bone. That means there's something severely wrong with the bone, whether it's a generalized or systemic metabolic condition, uh, metastatic carcinoma, diffuse osteopetrosis, Paget's disease. These are just a few examples of conditions that can weaken the bone. And once that bone is weakened, an anterolisthesis can easily occur. And that's referred to as a type 5 or pathologic spondylolisthesis. Lastly is type 6, which is post-surgical or iatrogenic. And this usually occurs where you have some type of surgical fusion, in this case a posterior lumbar interbody fusion at L5-S1, stabilizing the L5-S1 region, but now there's excessive motion at L4, and what has now occurred is an anterolisthesis, and this has occurred following the surgery, and this may be due to severe degenerative arthrosis or due to a, par a developing pars defect. But again, this is usually going to be post-surgical in etiology. Besides an anterolisthesis on an x-ray, there are multiple other radiographic features of a spondylolisthesis that may be present. Some of these findings include intervertebral disc narrowing or degeneration, if this spondylolisthesis has been there a while, anterior buttress formation, trapezoidal vertebral body shape, doming of the sacrum, and then lastly an inverted Napoleon hat sign. Now you don't have to see any of these, however if you do see them you may be more confident in your diagnosis of an antro or spondylolisthesis. This is a good example that shows an L5 anterolisthesis pars defect as well as moderate loss of the L5 S1 intervertebral disc height, doming of the sacrum, a trapezoidal L5 vertebral body shape, and then we have a hyperlordosis with an anterior shift on the lumbar gravity line. Also maybe a little mild sacral buttressing. And again these are common findings seen in a long-standing spondylolisthesis. In this example we can see a L4 anterolisthesis with severe degenerative spondylosis at L4-5. Sclerosis of the vertebral end plates and then irregularity of the articular surfaces of those vertebral end plates. Again common characteristics in a unstable, severely degenerated spondylolisthesis. In this case, we can see a really good example of an anterolisthesis, trapezoidal L5 vertebral body shape, severe L5-S1 degeneration, and then the sacral buttressing, an overgrowth of the anterior aspect of the sacrum to compensate for those degenerative changes. All right, and here's one more example of sacral buttressing. In this case, you can see a grade three spondylolisthesis of L5 in relation to the sacrum. And then look at this huge mess of osteophyte formation or a bone growth that's seen anterior to the sacrum. And remember, this is here um, in compensation of the forces and pressures being placed on the sacrum due to the anterior slippage of L5. And again, that's referred to as sacral buttressing, and that can be a sign of instability. Another example of a PARS defect, this one at L3 with an anterolisthesis of L3, severe degeneration, subchondral sclerosis and osteophytic ridging at the vertebral end plates. And maybe you can argue there's a trapezoidal shape of that L3 vertebral body. So another good example of these findings. The inverted Napoleon hat sign is a radiographic feature of a pretty significant spondylolisthesis of L5. The term itself is referring to a bird's eye view of the L5 vertebral body. This is the 
L5 vertebral segment. On the lateral view, you can see it slips so far forward, at least a grade 3. So when you look on the frontal view, essentially this is the path the x-rays are taking through L5 in the sacrum. So when you look on the frontal view, L5 and the sacrum overlap each other and you're left with this inverted Napoleon hat sign. And again, this is a sign of a pretty significant spondylolisthesis. Just because a spondylolisthesis is present, it doesn't mean that segment is unstable. In order to measure for instability, a key feature is utilizing x-rays to see if the segment moves back and forth uh, more than four millimeters in the lumbar spine. That means if you have a four millimeter anterolisthesis and it translates to eight millimeters with lumbar flexion, that would be considered unstable. Another thing to look at would be angular motion. And that can be anywhere between 11 to even 20 degrees in the lumbar spine, depending upon which spinal le level you're looking at. But angular motion of more than 11 degrees uh, can be indicative of instability as well. But remember, MRI is the gold standard for really looking at ligamentous injury, not x-ray. So in a situation where there is vertebral instability, as proven with flexion extension me measuring greater than four millimeters or increased angular motion, and the patient has neurologic symptoms, typically motor loss, loss of DTRs, deep tendon reflexes, or loss of um, you know, muscle atrophy or strength, then that can lead to a surgical consult. If a neurosurgeon decides to do surgery on a patient with an unstable spondy with neurosymptoms, then that surgery is done to stabilize the spondy, not to fix it and pull it back in place. And this is a common form of surgery called a posterior lumbar interbody fusion or p -lift. And there's also a, um, accompanying decompressive laminectomies and replacement intervertebral discs. And again, this is the end result of an unstable spondy with neurologic symptoms in the patient. Let's try a few questions. According to the Wilts classification, a spondylolisthesis that occurs due to degenerative arthritis is referred to as, and this would be a type 3 or degenerative spondylolisthesis. Which of the following is the most reliable line of mensuration slash indicator of a spondylolisthesis in the lumbar spine? And this would be George's line, D. A spondylolisthesis in the lumbar spine is considered unstable if there is displacement of greater than, and the answer here would be four millimeters. According to the Wilts classification, a spondylolisthesis that occurs due to a stress fracture during adolescence is referred to as, and this would be a type two spondylolisthesis. Which of the following best describes the visualized anterolisthesis? And this looks like a spondylolytic spondylolisthesis of L5, probably a grade one. So this is a grade one type two. An interruption of the pars interarticularis without anterolisthesis is referred to as and this would be a spondylolysis, a spondylolysis. Which of the following is a radiographic feature of an unstable spondylolisthesis at L5? The correct answer here is going to be a trapezoidal vertebral body shape, a trapezoidal vertebral body shape. According to the Wilts classification, any spondylolisthesis that occurs due to an underlying congenital abnormality is referred to as, and this would be a type one, type one.
Which of the following best describes the visualized anterolus thesis? At L4, we can see a substantial, at least grade three, and looks like a type two. So this would be grade three, type two, spondylolus thesis. All right, thanks for making it this far. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, please like and subscribe. Thanks.